Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter. The Transfiguration story is one of those stories told um, across three of our Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I mean, the story is fairly similar, which doesn't always happen, um, but a few of the differences will um, share this morning in the message. But here now, Luke's version of the events of the Transfiguration from chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Hear God's word for us this morning. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountaintop to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is God's holy word for us this day. Today's transfiguration story from Luke rests between passages that reveal what really might be going on on top of this mountain and how Jesus is not really being heard. In the verses right before, in chapter 9, Jesus tells his disciples that he will suffer, be rejected, be killed, and on the third day raised from the dead. The disciples hear these words, but they do not understand. Are they really listening? Just a week later, Jesus chooses a couple disciples and climbs a mountain outside of Jericho. Peter, John, and James are on the mountaintop with Jesus praying when everything gets turned around, transfigured. Jesus' appearance changes right before their eyes, like sunlight pouring from his face, turning his appearance inside out, one Bible version says. His clothes were filled with light as well, white as white can be, shimmering and glistening, bright as a flash of lightning. The blinding light of Jesus' face and clothing presented the glory of God right before the disciples on the mountain. If that wasn't spectacular enough, they then realized two men were in view in deep conversation with Jesus. Moses, the deliverer and lawmaker, Elijah, the representative of the prophets, and Jesus, the Son of God. What a glorious appearance they made. The three disciples who had been sleepily paying attention now rub their eyes, lift their heads, turn around and see Jesus in his glory and the two men standing <clears throat> with him. We are told that the disciples are now fully awake and they start paying attention 
as they hear the three talk of how Jesus would lead an exodus of his own to be completed in Jerusalem, delivering God's people from the bondage of sin and bring fulfillment of the work of both Moses and Elijah. The conversation on the mountaintop echoes the one held earlier down in the valley. There, Peter had declared Jesus to be the Christ and the Son of God. But now he and James and John are dazzled to see him in the company of Moses and Elijah, superstars of the Old Testament. They were convinced Jesus was the Messiah, but it had not occurred to them that Christ was in the same league with Elijah and Moses. Their misunderstanding is fully revealed when Peter, interrupting, offers to build three memorials, dwellings, or tents for the three men before him. Perhaps Peter had in mind Sukkot, the Jewish feast of tabernacles, when God's people were to dwell in handmade booths, like the fragile shelters the Israelites had in exile, to remind them that God delivered them out of the land of Egypt, and to look forward to the coming of the Messiah. But Jesus had just a week ago told his disciples that he was the one they were looking forward to, that he was the fulfillment of Israel's laws and prophecies. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. The disciples didn't understand a week ago, and although they are trying to be alert, they are not listening well now. They do not understand what Jesus is trying to show and tell them. Peter's focus is on comfort and providing shelter. He is all about building temporary structures to prolong the visit of these three important people, lawgiver, prophet, and Messiah. Not what Jesus was after. He wanted the disciples to understand what was going to happen in Jerusalem and what their responsibility would be as followers in carrying out God's work. The work that Jesus had trained them for. The disciples heard the words of Jesus, but are they paying attention and listening? Really listening to the place of understanding? A favorite philosopher that you might remember is the late Irma Bombeck. She once wrote an article in At Wit's End that answered the question someone asked her. If I had my life to live over, would I change anything? She said this. My answer was no, but then I thought about it and changed my mind. If I had my life to live over again, I would have listened more. I would have never insisted the car windows be rolled up on a summer day because my hair had just been teased and sprayed. I would have invited friends over to dinner, even if the carpet was stained and the sofa faded. I would have eaten popcorn in the good living room and worried less about the dirt when you lit the fireplace. I would have taken time to listen to my grandfather ramble about his youth. I would have burnt the pink candle, sculpted like a rose before it melted while being stored. I would have sat cross-legged on the lawn with my children and never worried about the grass stains. I would have cried and laughed less while watching television and more 
while watching real life. I would have eaten less cottage cheese and more ice cream. That's my favorite. I would have gone to bed when I was sick instead of pretending the earth would go into a holding pattern if I weren't there for the day. I would never have bought anything just because it was practical, wouldn't show soil, and was guaranteed to last a lifetime. When my kids kissed me impetuously, I would never have said, later, go wash up for dinner. There would have been more I love you's, more I'm sorry's, more I'm listening. But mostly, given another shot at life, I would seize every minute of it, look at it, and really see it, try it on, live it, exhaust it, and never give the minute back until there was nothing left of it. Irma Bombeck is talking about seizing and enjoying the everyday of life. Listening, really listening to the people around her. Turning around and paying full attention to those things that are really important. Those God things in life that we might tend to take for granted. That is what this story of Jesus' transfiguration is inviting us to do. Turn around. Pay attention. And listen. Really listen so that we might understand the best in life. Back on the mountaintop, while Peter is babbling about shelters, a light radiant cloud surrounded them. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, there they became deeply aware of God. From deep within the cloud sounded a voice, God's voice. This is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight, the chosen one. Listen to him. When the sound of the voice died away, the disciples were transfigured themselves. In a way, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid, he said. And when they opened their eyes, turning around and looking in all directions, all they saw was Jesus. Only Jesus. They were speechless. And they continued to be speechless, not saying one thing to anyone about what they had seen on top of the mountain. But I'm sure they never forgot what they saw and heard. God's voice speaks from the cloud that appeared and surrounded them. This is my son, whom I have chosen Listen to him. Listen to him. Pay attention. Wake up. Don't you get it? Imagine God's words. Listen to him. Echoing all around the mountaintop. Jesus, the Son of God, and God are trying to capture the disciples' attention and get them to listen. They are not understanding what is about to unfold, the purpose of the Messiah's life and ministry. Listen to Jesus. Turn around and pay attention. Stop looking for answers in the clouds. Turn around and understand what is about to happen. Turn around. And listen. Listen to him. God's voice bellows from the mountaintop cloud. 
Does God sound exasperated to you? This is my son, my chosen. Listen. How many different ways do the disciples have to hear this message before they come to understand it? What does Jesus have to do or say before we really listen? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that the next day, the three disciples and Jesus came down off the mountain where a big crowd was there to meet them. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in a new light up on the mountain, but now they are back in the valley, the valley of need and the needy crowd. That's where Jesus felt he belonged, and that's where the disciples, you and I, belong. We can't live on the mountaintop with our head in the clouds, not really paying attention and not listening. In the valley is where we need to turn around and listen. Be aware of what really is before us. Recently, I heard a song by Christian artist John Reddick. God turned it around. The words caught my attention. I'm praying, God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. Yes, God, turn it around. All of my hope is in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come in the name of Jesus. Reminds me of this transfiguration story where Jesus Christ's glory is revealed, breaking through the everyday stuff. But the disciples aren't listening and don't really see clearly. Then comes the bridge in the song. God is up to something. God is doing something right now. God is healing someone. God is saving someone. God is doing something right now. God is moving mountains making a way for someone. God is doing something right now. God is definitely up to something up on the mountain of transfiguration. Do we not see it? The disciples didn't. Even while wide awake, they could not understand. Perhaps as they stood in the valley before the crowd asking for healing, in the everyday hurts and needs of life, they heard God's voice ringing in their ears. This is my son. Listen to him. Maybe their mountaintop experience turned them around. With their head no longer in the clouds, with God's invitation to listen and pay attention could they wake up and see that God was up to something, breaking through, inviting them to be a part of what God was up to? In the week ahead, we will begin our journey through the 40 days and five Sundays of Lent. How will we prepare ourselves, turn ourselves around, and listen to Jesus? How well will we hear God's voice as we journey and learn to understand the meaning of what is to come in Jerusalem? God, turn us around so that we might listen and understand. God, turn us around to seize every moment of life. Look at it and really see it. Try it on. Live it. Exhaust it. And never give the minute back until there is nothing left of it. 
God, turn us around, break through and transfigure us so that we might clearly see and listen. Listen to Jesus, the one who must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Jesus, the Messiah, who must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. God, turn us around, and may we see the glory of the transfigured Christ before us, and may we listen to the Son of God, the Chosen One. May it always be so. Amen.